Today we're going to be talking about the question of whether or not there's a God, and in particular looking at some a priori arguments that Descartes gives, and earlier that St. Anselm gave, uh, in favor of God's existence. We'll also look at some objections to those arguments. These are really key to Descartes' entire problem, because he has to get us from the I think, I am, to some other bit of knowledge. So far, we've got some sort of reputation of the skeptic that actually it's not true that we know nothing, even if there's an evil deceiver arrayed against us out to deceive us in everything we do and everything we think. Nevertheless, we must exist in order for that deceiver to deceive us. We must be able to think in order to doubt anything that we actually believe to be true. So the I think, the I am, seem to be reputations of the skeptic. On the other hand, the skeptic can say, well, <laughs> All right, I'll give you the I think, and I am. You don't know anything else. That's all you've got. And Descartes vulnerable to that right at this point. We've seen an argument about clear and distinct ideas. But as we saw, that's not really all that compelling. What if the evil deceiver is messing us with us so that we think that all these false things are true not only in general, but clearly and distinctly? And so, although that's some reason to think we can trust ourselves, it's not much of a reason, and Descartes admits, look, it seems as if this is the case, but really I don't have a very powerful argument without the existence of God. So he really needs this. The first argument we're going to look at is actually the second argument Descartes gives. It's one that has a history before him. It's called the ontological argument, the argument concerning being. Ontology is just the study of being. So. This really starts from something that is like Augustine's definition of God. He talks about God as something than which nothing more excellent or sublime exists. Now that itself is not the same as the definition Anselm gives, though it's in that direction. It's really a question of defining God there as, well, the greatest existing thing. Now Anselm says, well, that's not really enough. I mean, it's obvious, maybe that there could be something in the universe that's greater than anything else in the universe without being God. So Anselm says, here's what we have to do. Not just think of God as the greatest existing thing, but the greatest conceivable being. He says, God is that the greater than which cannot be conceived. So God is defined as not just the greatest thing that exists, the greatest thing that could exist, the greatest conceivable being. Well, if we think of God that, then Anselm says we have to think of God as existing. And he gives us this argument. Now, what the status or intention of the argument is, I think remains a bit unclear. Because he frames all of this as a prayer. And all of it is in the second person, saying, you, O oh God, are this. You are the group that the greater than which cannot be conceived, etc. And that doesn't exactly make it sound like he's addressing the atheist trying to convince him. It's instead a prayer to God only. And so the way that Anselm himself presents this, this is faith seeking understanding. He is trying to understand the nature of God and the way in which various concepts relate. But in a sense, he admits this presupposes faith. And if so, we can wonder what the argument actually accomplishes. There is still a great deal of debate about this argument. Some philosophers think this argument works. Others think it fails. Other th other, others think it, at best, presupposes faith and gets you somewhere if you already presuppose God's existence. Well, here is how Anselm proceeds. He says, even the fool, and here he's referring to the Psalms. There are several Psalms in which it says, the fool has in his heart, there is no God. And so the fool here is just the fool from the Psalms, the person who says there is no God. Now he says, even the fool is forced to agree that something the greater than which cannot be thought exists in the intellect, since he understands this when he hears it, and whatever is understood is in the intellect. So we start with this assumption. The greatest conceivable being, that the greater than which cannot be thought, cannot be conceived. This is something he says is intelligent. After all, the fool says in his heart there is no God. What does that mean? Well, he understands the idea of God. Okay? He assumes that you know what God is, you're just denying the existence of it. And so he says, look, he understands this. When he hears it, he understands when I say God or when I say that the greater than which cannot be conceived. The fool understands that the fool just says, there is no such being. <laughs> there is no God. There is no greatest conceivable being in reality. And so he starts by saying, look, if, if the atheist admits that he or she understands God, <laughs> and understands, in other words, what God, the word God means, what the concept of God is, then it's something that must be in the intellect. It's something that is not incoherent. It's conceivable. 
But now, surely that the greater than which cannot be thought cannot exist in the intellect alone. For if it exists solely in the intellect, it can be thought to exist in reality, which is great. Now that's the key move of the argument. Suppose that you've got this concept of God. The fool says in his heart there is no God. And so has the idea of God in his intellect. But now suppose God existed in the intellect but not in reality. Well, then it would be possible to think of something greater than God. Namely, the being just like God, but then it exists in reality. Ah, but then it would be possible to think of something greater than the being than which it is impossible to think anything greater. Therefore, God exists. And that's Anselm's move. He says, if then the greater than which cannot be thought exists in the intellect alone, the same being, than which a greater cannot be thought is that, than which a greater can be thought. But surely this is impossible. Now, let's think about that argument for a moment, okay? The idea is God is, by definition, the being the greater than which cannot be conceived. Now, we think, suppose God didn't really exist. Exists in the mind, in other words, that in the sense that we have this concept but on the other hand, doesn't exist in reality. Then I can think of something greater, namely a being just like that, but that did exist in reality. Huh. So God must exist. God couldn't exist in the intellect. Are you convinced? Let's have the altar call. Who is willing to come up right now and say, because of Anselm's argument, oh, I give my life to God. Now, this is, there's something very strange. Right? There's something that feels very peculiar about it. Even to people who are believers. I don't know that anybody has ever said, oh, I believe because of that argument. <laughs> uh, and Anselm himself doesn't present it that way. As I've said, this is in the context of a prayer. So what's really going on here? Well, he concludes all of this by saying, therefore, there can be absolutely no doubt that something the greater than which cannot be thought exists both in the intellect and reality. Now, notice the way he frames this. It's useful for preparing ourselves for Descartes. He says, therefore, there can be absolutely no doubt. Here is one way of thinking about what this argument is doing in Anselm. It's not really so much trying to convince the fool, but there is a problem. Instead, it's really trying to say, look, this is something that cannot be doubted. And so, speaking here to the believer, you might occasionally entertain doubts. You might believe that God exists, but worry that maybe you're wrong. Maybe God doesn't exist. Relax. <laughs> Once you've got the concept of God, you can be assured that he does exist. And so here is one way of thinking about the argument. Uh, Anselm here is not playing offense. He's playing defense. <laughs> okay? This is a response to skeptical doubts. The skeptic says, hmm, you've been believing in God. What if you're wrong? You know, some intelligent people who are well-informed disagree with you. And what about this and that and the other thing? And you end up thinking, ooh, maybe I'm wrong. Perhaps Anselm's just trying to say, relax, you don't have to worry. We're going to see an argument next time from Pascal that I think has, to some extent, that sort of character, whose main utility is really in fending off doubt. Well, in any case, let's look at this argument in greater detail. Here's the general outline. Suppose you could conceive of God's non-existence. Then you could think of something greater than God, something just like God, but actually existing. But nothing can be conceived as greater than God, so God's ex non-existence is inconceivable. That actually takes over something that he brings out more explicitly uh, in a, what seems like a second version of the argument, where it's not just a question of what if God didn't exist, but what if God could even possibly not exist. Rest assured, that's inconceivable. <laughs> yeah? Why does this argument rely on the fact that God is the greatest thing in the universe? So why is that the baseline? Ah, okay, if we took as our assumption that God is the greatest thing in the universe, then you might think, wait a minute, that presupposes God's existence in the universe, right? And that's why Anselm doesn't just stay with Augustine's formulation of God is the greatest existing thing. It's really God is the greatest conceivable thing, not just the greatest thing in the actual universe, but the greatest thing in any possible universe. And so... He's trying to really say, look, I'm not assuming that God exists at the outset. I'm just assuming God is possible. I'm assuming that God is conceivable as this perfect being that is the greatest thing you could possibly think of. And then he's saying, suppose that thing didn't exist. So here I am imagining that the greatest thing that could ever exist doesn't actually exist. But then, wait a minute, a being just like that, that it did exist, would be even greater. And so I would have to think of God as existing. Now, 
<laughs> Here's one way of formulating it. Let's let the GCB be the greatest conceivable mean. Okay? That will be the abbreviation for that, the greater than which cannot be conceived. So here's the way the argument, I think, goes. Suppose this greatest conceivable being exists solely in the entity. Okay, it's just up here, not in reality. But I can think it to exist in reality. I could think of that being as existing. But now, if I do that, that being thought of as existing is greater than one existing solely in the intellect. Well, what that tells me then is that it is possible to think of something greater than the greatest conceivable being. But that's absurd. That's a contradiction. So, the greatest conceivable being can't exist in the intellect. Well, what do you think of that? Yeah. Um, is this like kind of like what uh, points to the basically is trying to justify that idea? So, this is who got the definition of the name. This definition is the whole thing. Ooh, All right, good, good, yes. We're starting with the definition of God, and in a sense, we're trying to get a priori the conclusion that God exists just by definition. Because what's the definition of God, the greatest conceivable being? But could we think of the greatest conceivable being as not existing? No, because then we can think of this greater being. And so God exists ends up being true by definition, just following from the definition of the term. Which is why this is an a priori argument. Notice that he doesn't, as Aquinas does or a variety of other people do, start with the existence of the world or things arranged in series of causes or anything like that. We've just got the concept of God. And so really we end up saying God is by definition that the greater than which cannot be conceived, but such a being necessarily has to exist, so God necessarily has to exist. And all of that is done just from definitions. Not anything about the world, not anything else. Yeah? What if things you can see be subjected to the person? Like, I mean, Ooh. maybe probably wouldn't be able to conceive like this giant god because we probably can see the greatest thing they can see is like the parent giving them food or something. Right. Okay, very interesting. She's saying, isn't what is conceivable subjective? Now, one way of thinking about his objection is to say, wait a minute, there's something very odd about this. It all proceeds by definition. But how can I define something into existence? I can give you definitions, but can I make things exist just by defining them? That seems really strange. And here we've got a different kind of objection. Notice the terms of this definition. I'm talking about what is conceivable. But what's conceivable depends on me. And indeed, maybe it does vary from person to person. Maybe I can conceive of all sorts of things you can't conceive of. Think about the Princess Bride and Fazzini saying, inconceivable. <laughs> and the response being, I, I don't think that word means what you think it means. It could be that you find something inconceivable that I can conceive of. And in general, we might worry about the connection between conceivability and possibility. Maybe I can conceive of things that are in fact impossible just because I don't understand them to see why they're impossible. Maybe there are things that are possible that I can't conceive of because they really go beyond my mind's ability to think about them. Yeah? Go on with that statement you just said that we have different variations of thought that can be conceived. Wouldn't it be like a rule to what everybody can conceive? Basically, because we're all finite beings without being in this cycle of time. So we can only go as far as finite goes. And because God exists in there, that may be something that we can actually do to, you know, like it's a rule to what can be conceived. Ooh. But since that, there is a roof, then we can define that as that can actually get something that puts it in the world, the greatest it's in. Right. All right. Yeah. Terrific. Two points I hear you say. One is maybe we don't have to worry about person to person variation because we can talk about what is conceivable by anybody, anywhere. And so don't think about what's conceivable for me or conceivable for you. Think about what is conceivable for anybody. Okay, and that gets rid of this possible variation from person to person. Even if you can't conceive of it, we can think, well, somebody could conceive it. But now there's a, another danger we have to steer away from. What if there is no such thing as the greatest conceivable being? What if we can just keep conceiving of things that are greater and greater? So, for example, think about the greatest conceivable number. And you say, ooh, I know, you know, 10 to the 10th to the 10th to the 10th. And I say, I can conceive of something greater. Take that to the 10th power. You say, oh, I can do better than that. Take that number to the 10th power. And so on and so forth, you just keep getting bigger, right? There's no such thing as the greatest conceivable number. 
And so you might worry, wow, greatest conceivable being, maybe it's like that. But he's got a response. He says, well, wait a minute, we're limited finite beings. And so maybe there really is a roof to what we can conceive of, not in the sphere of numbers, but in the sphere of just beings. Maybe, maybe there is or is not some greatest possible being, but if we think in terms of what we can conceive of, it's easy to imagine that even all of us together really end up being limited in what we conceive. And so there really is a roof, there's a boundary to the greatest thing we can conceive. Now, actually, I think Anselm would respond in a slightly different way, which is, look, perfection is perfection, man. <laughs> you can't do better than perfect. If you, it's not like numbers, right? If I say, aha, I've got the greatest possible number, the greatest conceivable number, you can always say, add one to it, and I've got you beat. <laughs> but suppose I say, the perfect being. Now, can you beat me? What's greater than perfect? What could be greater than perfect? Right? Suppose a being is all-powerful. It's all-powerful. And if you say, but what about a being that does one more thing? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. It's already all power. So in short, it seems to me that it's plausible to think that in conceivability, there really is some other boundary, either because we all taken together have limitations, or because perfection is just perfection. You can't do better than perfect. Now, here is a way of thinking about this argument, though, that might make you worry. Because there's something really strange about it. It does go from definitions to existence. And a lot of people have said, there's something very strange about this. I shouldn't be able to just give you a definition and get a conclusion about the existence of God or the existence of anything. So suppose we did this differently. Suppose we said, well, all right, let's imagine that the things that exist, the existing beings, are a subset of the things that are conceivable. So let's let that big blue circle be the set of conceivable beings. Conceivable not just by you or by me, but by anybody. And now think of the subset in the center there as the existing beings, the things that really exist. Obviously, I can conceive of all sorts of things that don't exist, like my millions of dollars in a Swiss bank account. <laughs> right? I can conceive of that, but it doesn't exist. So there are lots of things that are in that blue part outside the realm of existing beings. And now imagine that one of them is the greatest conceivable being. It's just defined as the being that is the greatest possible, the maximal conceivable being, okay? It's the perfect being. Now, so far, we're like the fool. We're not assuming that it exists. We're putting it out there in the circle of things that are conceivable but don't exist. Well, now, the argument basically says there's something wrong with that picture. Why? Because if I can imagine that being out there, I can imagine a being just like it in the circle of existing beings, and that would actually be greater. So I can go from that greatest thing to something even better, <laughs> something just like it, but that's conceived of as actually existing. Now, you might notice that as I went through this argument, I was cheating a little bit. I was talking about existing beings, but I was also talking about conceiving something as existing. And you might think there is a cheat. In fact, a friend of mine in graduate school once said as we were, <laughs> we were driving on Murray Avenue, my favorite pizza place, Look, this argument is clearly bad. And I said, what do you mean it's clearly bad? I just wrote Nicholas Rescher a paper of about 30 pages arguing that it was bad. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 it can't be bad. Why? Well, here's what he said. There's a sort of ambiguity here between conceiving of an existing being and conceiving of something as existing. Now, it's a subtle distinction, but maybe I can explain it this way. You could say, look, um, yeah, we say, there's a greatest conceivable being, but we could conceive something just like it, but actually existing, that would be greater. But now wait a minute, what's happening there? Am I, consisting of, am I conceiving of a being that exists, or am I conceiving of it as existing? Those are slightly different. So suppose we draw a distinction, and we say, wait, there are things that exist that I don't conceive of as existing. Okay, there are things that are real, that if, if you told me about them, I would have a conception, but I would think that's not real. So what's an example of something like that? Hard to point out, right? Because we'd have to say, it really exists even though I'm not thinking of it as existing. But we can think of it if we look into the past, things that people thought of as existing and didn't exist, or things that did exist, but they didn't conceive. Yeah? I guess a lot of the, a lot of the that happens when it's OK, good. Contemporary physics points to all sorts of things, like quarks, like um, superpositions, like uh, quantum entanglement. 
um, like, uh, gosh, what, hyperspace, that people did not conceive of earlier. If contemporary physics is right, there are all sorts of things that exist that at least earlier were never conceived of as existing. And so there's a difference between existing and being conceived of by people as existing. Other things that bring out that difference. Yeah. Oh, good. Everybody thought of the world as flat. And also, let's say they thought of this flat plane as existing, as the world. But actually, that sort of thing, a world that's just a flat plane, doesn't exist. And so you might say it was conceived of as existing, but it doesn't really exist. Yeah? Uh, kind of building on that, that uh, the Earth is the center of the solar system. Ah, good. Thinking if the Earth is the center of the solar system. Here was a picture, right? The Earth in the middle. And then the other planets and the sun revolving around the Earth, and then all sorts of heavenly bodies result, revolving around them. That Aristotelian Ptolemaic picture of the universe describes a universe that doesn't exist. It was conceived of as existing all the way up until the 1500s, but on the other hand, it didn't really exist. That's not the way the universe is. Yeah? Ah, extra extraterrestrial beings. You might think. <laughs> Yeah, it's one thing to say they exist. It's another thing to say we conceive of them as existing. It's easy to conceive of them as existing, but do they really exist? Well, what if they don't? Then we're conceive of some, conceiving of something as existing that doesn't really exist. I don't know if you saw this a few days ago. There was a news item picked up in one of the British tabloids that people discovered aluminum from 250,000 years ago. And it's this obviously man-made thing. And they said, oh my gosh, you know, we found something a quarter of a million years old in this riverbed in Romania, and it's proof of aliens, it's proof of alien visitation on the Earth. Now, yeah, like some of you are smiling. It's like, it was interesting to read the comments in the article. The first person really just said, I know what that is. It's the claw on an Earth mover. <laughs> and it broke off, and it looks just like that. And somebody else said, no, those couldn't possibly be made of aluminum. The guy said, well, actually, they often are to make this thing lighter. And it's more galvanized in such a way as to make the outside, number one, look cool, number two, test old. <laughs> but actually, um, it's just off a of modern bulldozer. So anyway, I'm not an expert in bulldozers or aliens, so I'm not quite sure. But in any event, clearly the tabloid writers were conceiving of these aliens as existing, and this being part of an alien spacecraft that might just have been a part of a Romanian bulldozer. Okay, so there's a difference between existing and being conceived of as existing. Uh, for a long time, people thought of the King Arthur myths as just myths. And so they thought of King Arthur as not existing. Uh, even though, I guess, the latest view is that there was such a person as King Arthur. Whether any of the stories of the round table were true of him or not, people doubt. But that there was such a person is probably the case. Another good example is the biblical book of Jonah. In general, people think Jonah existed but that the story of being swallowed by the whale and going to Nineveh and so on was not true. That it's really just a short story, not an attempt at history. But if that's right, well then, you know, Jonah is something, somebody who did exist, but on the other hand, didn't do those sorts of things. In any case, does this defeat the argument? Well, I think Anselm would say, actually it doesn't defeat the argument. It does mean that it hasn't proved God's existence, but here's what it has done it would still show that you can't really conceive of God without conceiving of God as existing. In other words, if you conceive of God as not existing, you could do better by conceiving God as, as existing. And in doing that, you would be showing that, as it were, being the fool who says there is no God, that you don't actually have an adequate concept of God. If you did, you'd be conceiving of God as existing. So, we might still try to conclude with Anselm that the fool is making some kind of mistake. He's saying, look, I have the concept of God, I have the same concept you do. I just deny that God exists. And Anselm's saying, eh, actually, my argument is meant to show you don't really have the concept of God that I do. Because if you really thought of God as the perfect being, the greatest conceivable being, you'd be conceiving of God as existing. So, that's why the fool is making some kind of mistake. Fool is conceiving of God without conceiving of God as existing. And so from that point of view, the argument isn't really about the left circle, the existing part. It's about the conceived of as existing part. And he's saying, in order to have the concept of God I have, you've got to conceive of God as existing. You can't say, I share your concept, but I don't think such a being exists. 
That is the impossible situation. On the other hand, there's something weird about that, because the atheist can always say, well, then I guess I don't have your comes of God. Uh, I still don't think any being like that exists. Um, it would mean that Anselm hasn't really proved God's existence, but he has shown that there's something weird about the atheist position that, in a sense, doesn't share the same concept of God. But that's at least what I think at the moment. My view of this argument changes every year. So next fall, I will think something different. <laughs> I can almost guarantee it. Anyway, there's a second argument about non-existence. And it really says, suppose you could conceive of God's non-existence. Suppose, in other words, it's even possible for God not to exist. Well, then you could think of something greater than God, something like God, but necessarily existing. And so God's non-existence really is inconceivable. There's a better version of it. Imagine even God's possible non-existence. Then you can think of something better than that, something like God, but that existed necessarily. They couldn't possibly not exist. And so it turns out God's possible non-existence is inconceivable. God must be conceived not only as existing, but as existing necessarily. Well, throughout the history of philosophy, Anselm's argument has convinced relatively few people. For example, it is not an Aquinas. And in fact, Aquinas says, no, this doesn't work. Why? Because you can't define anything into existence. That's actually his objection. He says there's no way to give a definition and actually conclude that anything exists as a result of your definition. So he says, look, there's a big difference between the world of ideas and the world of reality. You can't define things into being. And so there's something that goes wrong. So few people have been convinced. Nevertheless, <laughs> there have been some reactions that I think were especially interesting. One of them comes from a monk who was a contemporary of Anselm's and immediately wrote a response, saying there's something wrong with this argument. Why? Because it could prove the existence of the perfect island. Call this the lost island. There is somewhere this wonderful island that has been lost, but it is just perfect. It is the greatest conceivable island. I mean, think about what would make oh, an island wonderful. What are some qualities of an island that you would think, oh, that's just the perfect island? Great. Sorry? Go ahead. Great. OK, yes. What else? That's it. A robot to bring you food and drinks. Oh, robots to bring you food and drinks. Yes, awesome. Right? And preferably free. Like, I'll have a margarita. Yes. Margarita. <laughs> no need to take the robot that wrong. Yes. <laughs> oh, water where you can actually see your feet. Yes, nice. Clean water, clean beaches. It's exempt from like natural disasters. Good, exempt from natural disasters. You don't want to be there on vacation and suddenly swept away by a hurricane or a tornado or something. Say that again. High speed Wi Fi. Wow, you guys have a weird conception of Wi Fi. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, yes, I mean, anything you want, right? Available on this island. And so you might think, all right, good, I've got this vision of the perfect island beautiful water, beautiful clean beaches, wonderful weather, no possibility of any danger, anything I want, robots bring it to me, high speed Wi Fi, dancing girls, whatever it is I have to dream of at the moment, there it is on this island. Now, Gaunilo says, look, your argument is actually going to prove the existence of that island. But that's stupid. <laughs> OK, why is it stupid? Well, I think of the greatest conceivable island. Maybe I imagine myself there in that little cabana, out over that beautiful, clean water, enjoying a beautiful sunset. And now he says, wait a minute. They say there is somewhere an island called the Lost Island. The story goes it's blessed with all manner of priceless riches and delights in abundance. Now, if anybody tells me it's like this, I'll easily understand what's said. Nothing difficult about it. But if, in other words, it exists in the intellect, right? But if you should go on to say, though, we're, though we're a logical consequence of this, you can't any more doubt that this island that is more excellent than all other lands truly exists somewhere in reality, then you can doubt that it's in your mind. Since it's more excellent to exist, not only in the mind alone, but also in reality, therefore it must need to be that it is. So Gaudilo says, well, you've just given me the tools I need to prove the existence of a perfect island. Not just the perfect island, of course, the perfect anything. What about the perfect soulmate? I don't know if any of you have seen this new show on TV, The Good Place, but it's all about philosophy. It's about these two who are the main characters, really, 
uh, together with Ted Danson, who is like the angel that controls that neighborhood in heaven. And these two are matched up as perfect soulmates. And the guy on the left is a professor of moral philosophy, okay, who is then assigned the task of teaching that other poor person, who is not actually a very good person, how to be a good person. And so all of the episodes are about ethics. I mean, Jeremy Bentham, John Stuart Mill, Emmanuel Kant, Aristotle, Thomas Scanlon, all sorts of people get mentioned here as he's teaching her ethics. And actually, one of the writers is a UT grad who used to live in Jester West and studied philosophy here. So a, a shocking amount of it's very familiar to me. Yeah. But anyway, it's an awesome, awesome show. And there's this idea. Ah, your perfect soulmate is matched up with you in heaven. Whether or not you found them in life. But now you can think, ooh, perfect soulmate. Well, what would the perfect soulmate be like? Come on, don't be shy. Yeah. Your perfect soulmate would exist. Ooh, good, your perfect soulmate would exist. <laughs> you might say, oh, yeah, I've got this idea of a perfect soulmate. Somebody who understands me. Somebody who understands my goals and shares my goals and my preferences about lots of things. And we can communicate very easily and blah, 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 blah. Oh yeah, and this person exists. Now there's something a little strange about that, but still you might think, yeah, look, how could, the, how could this being that I'm thinking of be my perfect soulmate if he or she didn't even exist? I want somebody who exists. You might think, yeah, you're putting out a personal ad, okay? And you're thinking, okay, single white male looking for Existing being. <laughs> uh, we don't normally say existing being, but it would help, right? That somebody exists. So, here is Anselm's reply to Gamilo's objection. Uh, it's actually long, and he goes along at some length saying things that, well, pointing out a real mistake. There is a real mistake in this. Notice he says, the island that is more excellent than all other lands. All other conceivable lands, right? Not just all other existing lands. Land. And so Anselm points out, look, we've got to be talking about the greatest conceivable island, not just the greatest existing thing. Um, but, but that's not really crucial, because it's easy to repair for that. Here's the thing. He says, wait a minute, my premise was that a greatest conceivable being that exists in reality is greater than a greatest conceivable being that doesn't exist in reality. It's not just that existence always makes something better. A lot of people have thought of the argument as one that relies on that assumption, that existence makes something better. But does, existing, does existence always make something better? Can you take something that exists and say, ah, oh, it's better than this non-existing thing, in all cases? Can you think of anything where existing would make it worse? Yeah? Cancer. Cancer. Okay, yeah, I could be worried about getting cancer and worried about possible cancer. Well, okay, possible cancer is bad. Actual cancer is much worse, right? And so uh, if the doctor says, listen, the test results have come back in the day you do have cancer, I would think, oh, now my worries about possible cancer are worries about actual cancer. Actual cancer is much worse than possible cancer. So in that case, existence doesn't make it better, it makes it worse. Are there other cases where it doesn't make it better? Maybe it makes it worse, or maybe it doesn't do anything at all. What about a case where it doesn't make it better and doesn't make it worse? Yeah? Can you argue that God doesn't make it better and make it worse? Is it existing in the universe? Ooh, all right, good, good, good. Yeah, this has to do with my question about existing and conceived of as existing and so on. You might say, wait a minute, there's something. So leave it aside. And let's say, OK, yeah, you can't pull the same trick with islands and soulmates and so on. But still, is it true that the greatest conceivable being that exists in reality is greater than one that exists solely in the intellect? Um, it makes it sound like our conceivability has something to do with God's greatness. <laughs> and you might think, that's not right. I mean, God is great as an existing thing or as a non-existing thing, independently of our conception of it. And so whether we think of God as existing in reality or not, you might say it's the same God, right? If I'm thinking of the greatest conceivable being, and then you say, aha, you're conceiving of it as existing. Now Anselm would say, look, when I conceive of it not just as mere impossible but non-existent, but actually as existing, I am conceiving of something great because it's got existence as part of it. 
But it's open to you to deny it. To say, no, 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 it's the same conception. Thinking of it as existing doesn't make it any better. Let's take a look at a form of this argument in Descartes, because it in a way brings out an aspect of this argument more clearly and lets us focus on an objection closely related to, I think, what you have in mind. Here is Descartes' version in the fifth meditation. It's very simple. God is the perfect being. By definition, God has all perfections. But existence is a perfection. So God has existence. The end. There's something nice about this argument. It's not tricky in the way that Anselm seems tricky. I mean, it's very easy to remember. Anselm's, if you're trying to tell somebody this evening, after a few beers, what Anselm's argument is, it's easy to get confused, right? But it's not easy to get confused about that. Very simple. God's perfect, has all perfections. Existence is one of them. Duh. Bingo. <laughs> OK. Yeah? How do you determine existence? Ah, good. How do you determine that existence is a perfection? What do you mean existence is a perfection? Now, Descartes says some things to try to support this. Look, um, there would be a flaw in a being if it even could potentially not exist. Vulnerability, you might think of as a flaw. That is connected to possible non-existence. And why is possible non-existence a flaw? Well, because non-existence is a flaw. Let's go back to our soulmate idea and suppose that you're, uh, you, you're talking to a friend. And the friend seems all happy. And you say, what, what are you so happy about? And he says, oh, I met the perfect girl. And you say, oh, tell me about her. Well, she's wonderful. She's really smart. And you know, we just communicate naturally. She just uh, gets me, and I, I get her. And, and, and she's beautiful, and she's really nice, and, and just anticipates my thoughts. We finish each other's sentences. It's really fun to be around her, and blah, blah, blah. And you keep saying, well, this girl's amazing. You know, I'd like to meet her, too. And he says, well, I don't know. Uh, he says, well, why? You know, why? Are you ashamed or something? I mean, why can't I meet her? And she's like, well, you know, if she doesn't really exist. <laughs> uh, you might think that's a pretty serious flaw in this person, right? I mean, no, it's a, in what person? In a way, that's strange, right? What do you mean? It's a flaw in that person. That person doesn't exist. And still, it seems like there's a real problem with this girlfriend. <laughs> This perfect girlfriend who doesn't exist. So, Descartes would say, well, that tells us that existence is a perfection. It's a pretty important one. It's required for all other perfections. But Kant raises an objection. He says, look, exists isn't a real, or as he puts it, a determining presence. And what he means is this. It doesn't add anything to the content. So I say, imagine a dollar. Now imagine an existing dollar. <laughs> he says, there's no difference. Existing dollar doesn't actually add it. And it's the same with everything else. I say, imagine that there's an elephant right in the middle of this room. Now imagine that there's an existing elephant right in the middle of the room. <laughs> What's the difference? Right? It's the same thing I'm imagining. I'm imagining a scenario where there's an elephant in the room. And if I say, oh, make it an existing elephant, what am I doing? Am I actually adding any information? And Kant says, no, I'm not actually adding any information. So he says, existence isn't the kind of thing that could be a perfection or for that matter, an imperfection or anything like it, because it's not a real quality. Any more than you can say, oh, that girl has one problem. She doesn't exist. There is no girl to have that problem. And so you might say existence is a different kind of thing from saying somebody is smart or funny or easy to communicate with or anything like that. Those are qualities of people. Those are determining predicates of people. But existence isn't like that. And so he just denies that existence is a predicate. Indeed, suppose I said, look, we're going to have a paper contest for philosophy students. Submit a paper you wrote in a philosophy course, and we'll have a contest and determine the best paper. And actually, we do have a contest like this every spring. So if you write a good paper on philosophy, by all means, submit it. It's called the Machette Essay Contest. But anyway, suppose somebody says, listen, I wrote, you know, <laughs> well, actually, what are they saying? You might think, ah, oh, yes, I know. <laughs> I've got in mind the greatest possible paper. Okay, I think it should be. On the other hand, it does have one flaw. It doesn't exist. I haven't written it. But wow, would it be an awesome paper. Or imagine the committee looking and saying, I'm sorry, all of these papers, you know, fail. We can't award the prize this year. Why? Because we want to award the prize the greatest possible paper. And it doesn't exist. Nobody submitted. But actually, I think there's, it's not so clear that existing doesn't add anything. Go back to the elephant. 
Suppose I say imagine an existing elephant in the room. Is that the same as just an ima imagining any old elephant? Not necessarily. If I say imagine an elephant, you just have a certain vision in your mind. But if I say imagine an existing elephant there, I've now got to take a real elephant, like one in the San Antonio Zoo, and imagine that elephant there. And that does seem different. Or here's an old joke. Academics judge other academics on what they've written, <laughs> but they judge themselves on what they might write. <laughs> This is a deep truth, by the way. We look at other people, ah, what's that person done, this, that, that, that's not so great. But me, well, I haven't written yet, but man, I'm thinking about this book, and it's going to be awesome. <laughs> and so we're well aware of what exists and what doesn't exist, and we sort of cheat and evaluate ourselves by what we could do, evaluate other people what they have done. Well, let's take a look at a modern version of the ontological argument that have a somewhat different character and avoids all this stuff about conceivability. This is from Norman Malcolm in 1960 and Charles Hartshorn in 1965. It's possible that there's a God, okay? So the idea of God, the concept of God is consistent. There could be a God. Second premise is it's necessarily true that if God exists, God exists necessarily. God is the type of being that can't just happen to exist, can't just exist contingently, God might not exist, but if God does exist, God exists of necessity. It's not the kind of thing that's just like, well, you know, God's existence depended on some other thing. No, God's the most fundamental being. If God exists, God's existence is fundamental and necessary. Conclusion, therefore, God exists necessarily. Now, at first glance, you might think, well, wait, why is that? I don't get it. How does that follow? Here's the general idea. Okay? That purple world there is our world. And now, let's look at the first premise. It's possible that God exists. We'll understand this as Leibniz does. There is some possible world where there's a God. So I've imagined that is the red world there. God exists at that world. That's not our world, we're saying, at the beginning. That's some other world where God exists. But it's possible that God exists. There's some possible world where God exists. But now the second premise says it's necessarily true that. In other words, it's true in every possible world that if God exists, God exists necessarily. So go down to the red world. God exists there. So God exists necessarily there. But that means God has to exist in all those other possible worlds, including our world. So God has to exist in our world. God has to exist in every other possible world. So God exists necessarily. That depends on a certain way of thinking about necessity where all these possible worlds are sort of there on the same level. Um, but if you think of it that way, then the argument actually works. It turns out to be a valid argument. There is also an argument by Kurt Gödel that is a version of the ontological argument. And it's complicated, and I now have four minutes left. So I'm not going to say much about it, except to say Gödel is one of the greatest logicians of the 20th century. And it goes like this in general. It depends on the idea of a positive property. Some, positive, some properties are positive, others are negative, like being dark or being imperfect. Those are negative properties. But do I think being light, being perfect, those are positive properties? He makes some assumptions. He says properties that are positive are necessarily positive. And moreover, if F is a positive property, then not F is not a positive property. Any property that's entailed by a positive property is a positive property. And then he shows that each positive property is therefore consistent. It could be instantiated. Well, you can probably see now where this is going. <laughs> OK, God is going to, being godlike is going to turn out to be a positive property. What does it mean to be godlike? To have all and only positive properties essential. So being godlike is a positive property, we assume. And therefore, theorem, being godlike, is possibly instantiated. It's a positive property, and we've shown that all positive properties are possibly instantiated. But now necessary existence is a positive property. And so we can prove not only that anything godlike is essentially godlike, but that necessarily something is godlike. So something is god. Here you see a picture, by the way, of Albert Einstein who found this argument deeply suspicious. <laughs> Nevertheless, Gödel himself took it to be valid. Well, in the last moment, I just want to say something about Descartes' other argument. It's too bad that we only have a few minutes left to discuss it, because it's the argument that is the key for getting out of the cognitive, getting us out of our own heads to something else. 
How does it go? It's called the argument from thought. And it simply goes like this. I have the idea of God. I have the idea of God as a perfect being. Well, where do I get that idea? Where do I get the concept of God? I never experienced perfection. And so where is it coming from? Actually, it can't come from experience. In experience, I encounter things that are imperfect. So if I've got the idea of perfection, it's got to come from somewhere other than experience. But now, where could it be? Well, he says, actually, if it's not coming from experience, it must be innate in my mind. How did it get into my mind? Independently of experience, it's got to come from something perfect. So a perfect being, God, must exist. My idea of God, in other words, couldn't come from anywhere other than God, because it's an idea of perfection, and there's a very important principle in the back, which says that the cause of something is always at least as perfect as the effect. And so if my idea of perfection exists, there must be something that causes it that is actually at least as great as what is depicted in the idea, must in this case be perfect. So I will skip his actual words here and just go to this premise. The idea is the cause of the idea of x has to have at least as much reality as x. So the cause of the idea of a perfect being must have at least as much reality as a perfect being. And so just as I get the idea of fire from uh, fire, the idea of red from red things, so I get the idea of God from God. 